Hello again guys, it's me Unstable Voltage and welcome to Crusader Kings 2 on this little tutorial series where I'm trying to teach new players or people who haven't played the game but are interested in getting started that the game isn't quite as scary as it looks. In the first video I did talk about starting a game, I showed you how to find your own lands on the map and to deal with the initial pop-ups you get when the game starts, which included picking a focus, selecting your ambition, getting married, checking what claims you have and all of that sort of good stuff. So there are a couple of other things that you do need to do at the start of the game and one of those is to deal with your council so this row of buttons on the top left hand corner next to your portrait the first one is your council button now you will have five councillors now these councillors will all be people in your court and they will all hold different ranks as you can see this guy is actually a duke and the rest of these guys are probably all counts with the exception of our spy master our spy master is actually our mother one of the few roles that the women can actually be in this game in the council is spy master so normally your spy master can very often be your mother and um, very often be your wife now each of these people has their own relationship towards you you can see most of our people like us but our chancellor doesn't like us all that much he's a bit of a pain so we've got various things that we can see here and various options. First thing you'll notice is that each of these different people has a number in the top right hand corner. Now that number represents their particular skill uh, at, their, at doing their job. And each one again is colour coded. So as you can see... If we just click on our portrait, we've got these colour codings again. The blue is Diplomacy, the red is Martial, the green is Stewardship, the purple is Intrigue, and the grey is Learning. So if we actually go and look at the Council again, we can see these have the same colours. Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, Intrigue, and Learning. And these numbers represent these people's individual skill. So our Chancellor, Duke Cunald actually has a skill of 18 in Diplomacy, which is why it says 18 there. Our Martial... Count Thurimba actually has a martial skill of 17. Our steward has a steward skill of 14. Our spy master, the Queen Mother, has an amazing score of 23. I'm not sure what the max is. The most I've ever seen is 30, but it may well go beyond that. And our bishop has the learning skill of 18. And indeed, if we actually click on our spy master, if we click on our mother, we can indeed see that she does have an intrigue of 23. So that's how that works. You can assign new people to these positions if you wish to. You just click the appoint button and that will give you a list of your uh, council. And again, you can use these buttons to sort by various different things. So if we actually click on diplomacy, by default it should be, we can actually see that the high, second highest person uh, in diplomacy is this guy who has a diplomacy of 15, which is not good as, our, as good as our uh, current chancellor who has a diplomacy of 18. So even though he doesn't like us too much for the moment, we are actually going to try and keep him happy. So each of these people can do various different things. If we look at our Chancellor, he has three things he can do. He can improve diplomatic relations. So he has a 68.48% chance yearly of improving relations with the Lord. Or he has a 4.15% chance yearly of sabotaging relations with the Lord. So even though there's a 68 0.5% chance of a positive outcome per year. There's also a 4% chance of a negative outcome per year. Now, this is basically used to try and get somebody else to like you a little bit more, and that's something we'll be making a lot of use at. He can also attempt to fabricate claims because you can only declare war against someone in this game if you have a valid lawful reason to. So you need to have some sort of claim on a title in order to be able to attack somebody. So you can actually go and send your Chancellor to try and fabricate a claim on somebody else's lands so that you can go to war over it. And again, he has a chance of the positive outcome of fabricating a claim, but there's also a chance that he will infuriate the noble of the land that he's trying to claim. Also, this guy can sow dissent, so he can basically uh, go into somebody else, well, go into one of your vassals and um, lower their opinion of their direct lead. So maybe he'll go into a county and get that um, county to dislike their uh, ruler somewhat. Not something that you're going to use all that often, it's mainly going to be these first two. We'll come back to him in a moment because he's going to be quite pivotal to something we're going to do. 
Now, our marshal has a few options here. Our marshal can either um, suppress revolts, which means that he... If, he, if you put him in a specific um, county, he will try and reduce the chance of any re re revolt risk there. He also increases your arrest chance. If you want to arrest a specific character and you only have a certain percentage chance of the arrest being successful, making sure that your marshal is in that particular uh, place on the map will give you an extra 17% chance of success. You can also use him to train troops, which increases the levy size and the reinforcement rate. And you have the option to research military tech. Tech is something that we will come uh, to a little bit later on. Not all that important. The main thing I'm going to want to do early on, because there will be a few early wars in this game, is we want him to train troops. Now, as you can see, the levy size and the levy and reinforcements is a percentage. So we want to send him somewhere where we already have a decent number of reinforcements and a, a decent levy size, because having a... 42.5% of a larger levy is going to be better. If we look over at the outliner, uh, we can see here on the far right hand side, it tells us what our levy size is. Now the levy size is the number of men that we have available to fight. So if we actually look, the largest one is this one, 671, and this is at Groningen, which is this, um, it's basically Friesland up here. So we, if we're looking at this, um, this county, we can see that we have um, this uh, this castle here, and we have, if we mouse over these little bars below the picture, levies 671, and it gives us the breakdown. 238 light infantry, 306 heavy infantry, 25 pikemen, 85 light cavalry, and 17 archers. You can also see that because we have a high martial skill, it actually gives us an extra 65% bonus. So having that high martial skill certainly helps us because it means that we have a fairly decent uh, increase to that. Now... A certain amount of troops are always left behind in the garrison, and then everything else is surplus on the top. Now, there will be levies from our vassals, like these guys down here, but they might not actually give us any additional men. The number of men your vassals will give you in a war is based on two factors. One, it's based on how much they like you. And it's also based on the laws. So you can set a law that says they must give you, by law, a certain percentage of their men if you call upon them. But if they like you more, they're more likely to give you more men. And we'll talk about laws later on as well. So this is the county that is producing the highest manpower for us, the biggest levy. So we're going to take our marshal and tell him to train troops and we're going to drop him in that county there. And he will work to try and increase the number of troops. Next, we're going to look at our steward. There's a couple of jobs that our steward can do. He can collect taxes, which would give us a th plus 35% local um, tax modifier. Um, there's also a 10% chance yearly that he'll collect a special tithe, which means we'll get a bit of a bonus. But there's also a 2% chance yearly that he'll be attacked by peasants and probably killed. He can also oversee construction, which means that if we're building a uh, building within one of our holdings, he will actually in uh, increase its production time by 35%, or he'll actually reduce the time it takes for it to be constructed by 35%. Um, there's also an 8% chance yearly that he will meet a master builder, which will speed things up even more. But there's also a 4% chance yearly that the construction will be sabotaged and set back. And the other option is researching the economy tech, which again, isn't something we're going to bother with. We'd like to get some taxes, we'd like some more money in the coffers, and again... If we look over here at our holdings, we can see the two that are providing the most money are um, Groningen, the same place that's providing the most troops, uh, which is actually providing us with, because we can get the exact breakdown here somewhere, make sure we get the exact number. Oh, if we actually click on the, uh, the castle picture there, um, it's providing us with 6.55 ducats per month. Or is that per year? I think it's per year. Uh, and this is the actual screen where you can also upgrade any buildings within that particular holding. So you can see here that anything that is showing a, um, a little red building means there's a prerequisite building that you need before you can build it. And you also need the money. Anything that has these little gear symbols means you need a prerequisite tech before you can build it. And anything with a little green hammer means you can start that building. So we're getting 6.55 ducats here. And if we go and have a look at the other one, which is the province next to it, 
Uh, this is giving us 6.54. Not a huge deal of difference in it, but this one's definitely giving us the most. So we're going to go in, we're going to take our steward, we're going to tell him to collect taxes, and we're going to drop him in there. Next is our spy master. There's a couple of things our spy master can do. Our spy master can scheme, which means they have more chance of uncovering plots. And um, there's also a chance that thugs will uh, try and attack the spy master. Uh, the spy master can also try and discourage vassals from joining factions against us. Uh, but sometimes um, we can also encourage nobles to join our factions if we're plotting against someone else. The other option is to build a spy network. By putting the spy master in somebody else's lands, you can actually try and increase your plot power against somebody and they can study technology. What we're going to do for the time being with our spy master is we're going to scheme because we want to try and uncover plots. And we're going to put our spy master here in our kingdom capital. Best place to try and uncover plots. Now you will notice sometimes there is a limit to where you can actually put certain people. There are limits to the... Uh, particularly with things like the marshal and the steward, they can only uh, raise levies or collect taxes in my um, domain. They can't c try and collect taxes or raise levies in uh, lands that we don't control directly. Also, once you've moved somebody, you can't move them again for, I think it's about six months' time. So you can't just move somebody every couple of days. You do have to give them six months between doing stuff. So the last one here is the bishop. Now we've got some options with the bishop. We can either send him to a county that has a different religion in the hope that he will try and convert it to our religion. And if you ever want to check, there is a religious map mode, which is this button here that looks like the cross. If you click on that, and you can see that most of the stuff is Catholic, which is what we would be as the uh, as the Franks. And you will see there are some heretic religions and things around. If you zoom out, you can see them more easily. Uh, but you can actually use him to try and convert religions if things start to change. His other option is to research the cultural tech and finally improve religious relations. Now, what we want to try and do is we actually want to try and improve our religious relations with the Pope. So we're going to click on that and we're going to go all the way down here to the papacy, to Rome, and we're going to go and send him there because down here we actually have um, the Pope. And the interesting thing with the way that vassals pay you in this game and again if we go and look at one of our um, own holdings let's look at uh, our capital again here uh, you can actually see that we do have a, uh, a bishopric down here and if we go and ha actually have a look at our uh, our bishop himself and um, we can see that he, he has an opinion of us he he likes us by um, 28 it's not much the maximum is 100 he doesn't like us all that much uh, but what will basically happen uh, if we actually, yeah, because that's his opinion of the Pope. So if we click on our bishop, who is in our bishopric, and we actually look in court, and we can find that he uh, he's, he's the only person in that court. Now, he likes the Pope by 64, and he likes me by 28, which automatically means I get absolutely no tax from him at all. He's making a fair bit of money. He's making 14.3 ducats per year. But he's not paying any of that to me. He's paying it to the Pope. And the reason he's paying it to the Pope is because he likes the Pope more than he likes me. And that's always the way it is with bishops. If bishops like the Pope more, they will pay all of their money to the Pope and they won't give you any levies. Now, I could take the bishopric for myself. I still have... Uh, an extra space in my domain. It's actually saying five of seven when I mouse over it for some strange reason, but I could actually take it for myself. I could strip him of his title and claim the bishopric for myself if I wanted to. Now, it would give me a penalty because it would be the wrong holding type. I'm not a bishop. I shouldn't have a bishopric. But if I did hold the bishopric myself, at least then I would be getting, I think you get a 75% penalty. But at least I'd be getting 25% of that 14.3 ducats as opposed to none of it at all. So I could do that. I'm not going to do it right now, but it is a very important thing to do. And what we can do is if we actually get friendly enough with the Pope, and he likes us by 67, he likes us quite a bit. If we get friendly enough with the Pope and if we gain enough piety, we can actually go to the Pope and ask for money. We can request money because it costs us 100 piety, but the Pope most of the time is absolutely loaded. The papacy usually has a massive amount of money. I mean, look at that. Church tax. 
The papacy is actually getting 148 ducats a year. And that money is coming from the bishoprics that aren't paying gold to their lieges. So he's making 170, 173, almost 174 ducats per year. So the Pope always has a lot of money. So that's that sorted there. So finally, we've got our Chancellor. Now, what I want to do with him, I don't want to claim... Um, to fabricate any claims because as we discussed before if we look at our diplomatic rep uh, rep uh, relations there's already a massive amount of um, space uh, that we could lay claim on you'll also see a little bit of extra blue on the map now this is because we now have that alliance with um, the king of uh, Lombardy because we married his daughter so we have that alliance but a very important thing to find out is who you need to raise your reputation with so we're going to click on the king's portrait or our ruler's portrait and then over here on the top right hand corner you'll see you have this little button that says realm tree if we click on the realm tree it brings this up we'll make it full screen just so it's a little bit easier to see and if we mouse over here it tells us a little bit about us to our vassal holdings uh, particularly if we put the mouse over the 100% because the 100% is basically our top level of levy that's 100% of the troops that we have would be 3047 men if we actually click this plus button down here at the bottom this expands out the list of all of our direct vassals. These are all the people who swear fealty to me. Now, if we actually look at them, they all have a percentage at the top. Now, that is the percentage of my troops that that vassal controls. So, if 100% of my troops is 3,047 men, this guy actually controls 1,856. Now, as I said before... The more somebody likes you, the bigger percentage of their men they will give you when you call them to war. So what you want to do is improve the relations with whoever has the biggest portion of your army. Because if they turn against you, not only do they already have a pretty sizable army, but they're also taking the lion's share of your army with them. If I was to lose 61% of my army if this guy turned against me and i lost 61 percent of my men he'd be more powerful than me he controls more than half of the manpower in my kingdom so he's definitely somebody that i want to keep happy with however he does have a positive relation with me at the moment so does the next guy now the next guy along who has one of the lowest repu repu uh, relations of me he actually hates me he has a minus 100 um penalty against me because he hates me i don't know why he hates me but he does um now this guy is actually my chancellor now this is something that's actually quite strange something that you can do so we can actually find where this guy is by clicking on his little flag there and we can see that he's the duke of this um, this duchy here there's his flag it matches the one next to his portrait what we can actually do is we can go into our council we can appoint our chancellor to improve diplomatic relations somewhere and we can send him to the capital of this duchy now this is where it's a little bit strange because he's basically improving relations with himself but it does work we could try and appoint a different chancellor but as we already looked before when we looked at our court there isn't anybody who has as high diplomacy skill as he does so we'll keep it at that and we'll try and see if we can improve some uh, relationship that way so we've had the game paused for long enough we're going to unpause it and let it tick i'm going to leave it on the slow speed just for now obviously you guys can play on whatever speed you feel comfortable with we fulfilled the ambition to get married because we did that in the last video now it gives us another pop-up because we get to pick another ambition we have very few to choose from here we can either try and um amass some wealth have a personal wealth of 500 ducats or become a paragon of virtue let's try and amass some wealth we will be spending some money but hopefully not too much too quickly now one thing that we could do if we do have someone that we don't like and we want to get rid of them because we already know that this duke hates us we could plot to kill him if we wanted to because if we have a look at his heir his heir dislikes us as well but at least his heir only dislikes us by 19 but his heir is actually heir to the liege of um the count of foie who is um a vassal of the uh, duke of gascogne who in turn is a vassal of me so they're all sub vassals 
But what we could do, let's just go back to him and find him again. If we go back to our Chancellor, is we could click this little button below his shield and choose a plot. And if we click, the only option you will ever have is the, the kill plot. So... If we click on that and click OK, we're not going to do it. I won't even bother and pausing the game. But as you can see, we have a total plot power of 23. Now, if we click on this plus button, this will give us a list of all the people that we could invite to the plot. Now, these are all the people within our court. These are all potential plotters. Most of them have this little red thumbs down icon, meaning that they wouldn't really join the plot. Some will have a green thumbs up and some will have a sort of a yellow flat hand to say they may or may not join the plot. Uh, you can always click this button to auto-invite people to join the plot, and we may get some plotters against him. But he does have a good diplomacy skill. I'd rather not kill him off just yet. But, however, uh, this screen that's just popped up is actually the Intrigue screen. If we look at the Intrigue screen, we can actually see that he is considered a threat. Because he has such a low opinion of us, and... He could very well start a faction. There's another button up here on the top bar that says factions. If we click on factions, you can see he is actually trying to lead a faction against us. He's trying to lead a faction for the elective succession in West Francia. Now, at the moment, he doesn't have any supporters. But he does have a strength of 925 men, which is 45% of what I own in total. So it would be very, very nice to get rid of this guy if we could do it. So we'll actually click this button to auto invite plotters and we'll see how many we can actually get on board other things that you see on this intrigue screen are any prisoners if you have them and it will give you the option to ransom them to execute them to banish them and various other options and also known plots this is plots that your spy master has discovered um, that are happening in the realm there's also a button to the right that isn't marked unless you mouse over it to auto stop plots if you click the auto stop plots button uh, a message will automatically be sent to any known plotter asking them if they will stop it doesn't mean that they will but it means that you don't have to do it manually and keep an eye on it there's also a list here of various different decisions that you can take. Now, only the ones that have the little parchment with the green tick lit are the ones that you uh, can do. These are the ones that you actually meet the requirements for. If you ever want to know what the requirements are, uh, you just have to mouse over the little question mark to the left and it'll tell you uh, what you need to do. And if you mouse over to the, the parchment on the right, it'll actually tell you what you get from it. So... We can hold things like feasts and some affairs that cost us a little bit of gold, but would give us some additional prestige. They are things we'll do. Uh, a couple of things that you can actually do, and you can pretty much do this with anyone. If you do need a big boost of money early on, uh, you can actually borrow um, 300 gold or 300 ducats from the Jewish merchant, merchants. Now, you do actually lose a um, lose. 10% opinion from all of your temple uh, vassals, so your um, your bishops don't like you much from uh, borrowing money from the uh, from the jury, and you do have to pay it back with interest, um, which is fine. That's not a problem. But what you can also do is that you can then expel the jury, and if you expel the jury, you lose minus two diplomacy. But on the plus side, you don't have to pay them back the 300 gold. In fact, the 350 gold with the interest. But you don't have to pay them back the 300 gold. And you also confiscate another 200 gold when you expel them. So if you borrow 300 gold from the Jews and then instantly expel them, you get an instant free 500 gold at the cost of two diplomacy and um, a, a, a 10... Uh, a 10 figure hit to your reputation with your temple vassals which isn't too bad um one thing that will happen though if you expel the jews you do get uh, some setbacks to the rate at which you discover technologies which can be a little bit of a problem so do it in a pinch if you need to it's a good way to take a loan but if you don't need to do it i suggest not doing it what will happen after a certain length of time is you will get the decision to be able to invite them back and if you invite them back you can actually repeat the process you can invite them back borrow 300 kick them out get another 200 uh, but again you'll still take that diplomacy hit so i would advise against it i'm going to unpause the game and see how auto inviting backers will work if anyone is actually willing to join this plot and at the moment doesn't actually seem like anyone is willing to. It's only auto-invited this one guy. Now, he's he's just lit up green, which means he's backing the plot. But we still only have a plot power of 28.3. That isn't enough. Uh, I think you need, you need to have at least one backer. And I think you need to have a plot power of at least 80% 
for it to have any chance of success. If you get it up to like 200, and you can go well over 200, I've seen some plots that have gone up to like 300 and 400%. If you can get it up to sort of 200 and above, then they're going to die and die very, very quickly. No one seems to be willing to back this plot. So I'm going to cancel it before it gets discovered. Because if it gets discovered, it's most likely going to cause me some other problems. You can see there are a couple of other threats popping up. But what we're going to try and do is do our best to just keep them happy. Now, if, of course, they do get powerful enough, they could declare war on us. That's not going to be too much of a problem. I'm not worried too much about that right now. Uh, we do have an alert because this alert is now telling us that there is a dangerous faction because they've actually got um, their strength up to 71%. So we'll probably only attack us when he gets to 100% or more of the relative strength. Now we will have various allies that we can call upon. Um, we could probably even still call upon our brother. He is still potentially considered as our ally and indeed he is. So even though we're bitter rivals, he is still technically my ally and I could call him in a defensive war as well as being able to call upon the King of Lombardy. So we do have some options there if the uh, AI decided to go to war against us. In the meantime, I'm just going to increase the speed a little bit. So I'm going to press the plus button twice. As you can see, the clock will go up a little bit faster there. And we have a... Um, blue so it's it's uh, diplomatic technically uh, but this is from our mother the queen mother who is in fact our spy master your mother has come to see you she speaks of you uh, she speaks to you of your brother and the rivalry between you my dear charles it grieves me so that your brother carloman will not support you as he should but rather his wicked designs on your domains rest assured however that i should do all in my power to help and support you i've even written to him asking him to cease his plotting and acknowledge that, though the realm is divided between you, he recognises you as the primary ruler of the Franks. I fear, however, that he will not listen to me. So, basically, this is just uh, our mother coming to us and saying that she's written to our brother and telling him to stop plotting against us. Um, our opinion of our mother is changed by plus 10 for five years, and her opinion of me is changed by plus 30 for five or ten years. I've forgotten already. It hasn't even got off the screen yet. So this is another one of the decisions that comes up right here. Your son Pepin is illegitimate, but perhaps he could grow into a man worthy of ruling the Franks. His body is twisted and he looks frail, but a boy that overcomes such unfair punishments in life could perhaps with time become an even stronger ruler. So we have two options here. We can either choose not to legitimise him, and if we choose not to legitimise him, we will lose 50 prestige and he will be considered an illegitimate bastard. If we legitimise him, we will lose 20, uh, 20 piety, but he loses the trait bastard, he gains the trait legitimised bastard, he'll still be known as the Hunchback, which is um, historically correct, Charlemagne's son was Pepin the Hunchback, and um, Himmeltude's opinion of King Carlin changes by 40 uh, for 10 years, and Queen, uh, the Queen's opinion um, of the King changes by minus 50 for 20 years so Pippin's mother would actually uh, gain some um, positive opinion with us but our wife wouldn't like it uh, we are going to go ahead and legitimize him you now have a new heir. If your character dies you will now play as Prince Pepin the Hunchback because that's what we wanted to do if you remember before our heir up until this point was actually our brother because we had no legitimate son now we have a legitimate son, he is our heir. So if at any point Carlemagne dies, we will take over as Pepin. Now Pepin at the moment is, you know, the dates are wrong, but Pepin is only a few months old. So at the moment, you know, there's not a, an awful lot that he can do. And we'll have to sort of get his skill points up by teaching him and hoping that they go up as time goes on. But at least now we have an heir. So there's one other important decision that we should get. And we should get it fairly soon. So we'll keep our eye on that. Now a few other things that I haven't mentioned over here at the top. So I've gone through the uh, the gold, the prestige, the piety, our uh, domain size. Now we also have the vassal limit. There's a limit to the number of vassals you can have. Now these are direct vassals. So if I own a... If, I'm the, if I have uh, dukes as vassals, they count as vassals. If these dukes have counts as their own vassals then they don't count towards my vassal limit because they're sub-vassals. They're a vassal of a vassal. They don't count towards my limit. So what happens sometimes is you may end up with like 
four counties. And those four counties, or those four counts, are all your vassals, which would give you you know, plus four on, on this total limit here. However, if I was to turn those four counties into a duchy, assuming, of course, they are all part of one du jour duchy, and these ones aren't, for example, but um, this is a good example. These two places here, these are two counts, and these two counts are both in the Luxembourg duchy. In fact, there's three counts. This one's Luxembourg as well. So we've got three counts here, and these three counts, I'm his liege. This count... I'm his liege, and this count, I'm his liege. So you've got three counts, three counties that are all my direct vassals. So that's using up three of my vassal limit. If I was to create the duchy of Luxembourg and give the duchy to somebody, then that duke would become my vassal. And the counties within it would be the duke's vassals. So therefore, instead of using up three of my vassal limit, it would only be using one. Because I'd have one duke instead of three counts. So that's a very important thing. Because you need to always try and keep these numbers lower than, um, than your max limit. Because if you go above your max limit, you will start to take penalties. I should end this video because it's been going on for a while. I was just hoping that we would get the last... Um, relevant decision that normally pops up quite soon uh, when playing as uh, Carloman, but it hasn't popped up right now. Uh, I have played um, a game before as Carloman, and one thing that I did um, find that happened early on is we actually got called into a couple of defensive wars that are uh, with our brother, which actually hasn't happened this time around. So there are certain random elements to the game, which is fine. Um, I don't want to run it on too high speed in case too many things fly past, but I was hoping we'd get this event, so let's just knock it up uh, one more in terms of speed. Just quickly hit pause and have another look at the realm tree and just see the, the sort of happiness thing. Um, this guy's opinion of us still hasn't improved all that much. This is our... Um, uh, Chancellor, remember, we are actually trying to uh, make him a little bit happier. One thing we can do with him is we can right-click on him. We can, we can actually award him an honorary title. Now, giving somebody an honorary title doesn't do anything to them, really, other than make them a little bit happier, except court jester. If you make somebody a court jester, uh, they will actually get a negative 10 opinion of you and you will lose some prestige. But all of the other things you can actually give them, which will increase their opinion. The only one you want to be careful of is the designated, uh, designated regent. Now, you have a regent in several cases. If you you are an, uh, a ruler who is too young to take the throne. So if you're younger than 16, you have a regent who rules in your stead until you're old enough to take the throne. If you are a leader who is old enough to take the throne, but you are incapable of ruling because maybe you've been injured and you're in a coma, or maybe you've been injured and you're a big dribbling vegetable and you just can't actually rule anymore then you would have a designated re well you would have a region and selecting someone as a designated region you maybe don't want to do that to somebody who doesn't like you because they may screw you over uh, but it does give you the biggest opinion change um keeper of the swans would be plus 10 plus 10 master of the hunt plus 10 um cup bearer is that still plus 15 yeah plus fairer uh, uh, well words cup bearer so it doesn't really do anything. They don't actually um, check for poison for you. But it would give him a plus 15 opinion of us. We'd have to pay him a little bit of a salary. But we gain some extra prestige from it. So let's go ahead and give him that. He's currently got an opinion of... Uh, it looks like negative 62. So we'll go ahead and um, make him the cut bearer. We'll just uh, unpause the game a little bit. And actually, it hasn't updated. But it does say that the opinion has changed. There we go. Negative 47. So he doesn't hate us quite as much. We do still need to increase the uh, opinion of these guys. Now, if you remember this guy here, at one point, he actually controlled 41% of our uh, men. He now only controls 39. Uh, and that may be because he's actually lost some land. Because what happens is, your vassals will fight amongst themselves. And they'll take land from each other. I generally don't end up getting involved in that. But there we go. Now, this is an event. This is a diplomacy event, but it's actually from my marshal. My liege, since I arrived in Friesland, there has never been a shortage of soldiers reinforcing the troops stationed here. Under our guidance, they believe fame and fortune awaits them. Your humble marshal. So, levy reinforcement rate plus 50%. So, that's one of the um, events that can uh, proc randomly. If always auto saves when you least need it to if you remember the marshal has a 32.4 percent yearly to get the levy reinforcements which is what just happened and even though it's a percentage yearly 
there's a chance that it could happen every month. So it doesn't mean that it, it can only prop once a year. It might prop three or four months in a row. I've seen it happen with certain things. Doesn't look like the other event that I was waiting for is going to happen. So instead of speeding through a lot of the game's time and not having anything happen, I'm going to end this video there. And then when we come back next time, Maybe we'll see if we can press some claims of our own and start a war or two while I wait for said event. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope you are still enjoying Crusader Kings 2. And I hope that these videos have been a little bit useful in giving you an idea of how to sort of start the game and the basics of the interface and the mechanics. If you are still enjoying these videos and you want me to continue making more, as before, please like and comment so that I know that it's worth my time to, uh, to keep doing them. And I'll see you on the next video. So until then, goodbye for now.